I read a story the other day about a little boy named Paul who woke up one morning to discover to his great shock and sadness that his favorite pet canary had died. And because his mother was next door talking to the neighbor and he needed someone to talk to, he picked up his home telephone. Now this was way back in the early days of the home telephone where when you picked up the phone, you could speak directly to the operator. And long story short, the operator found herself in conversation with a little boy who was inconsolable at the loss of his pet. She tried to say the usual things grown ups say to soothe the child, but Paul was so distraught. He asked her, why is it that birds should sing so beautifully and bring joy to all families? only to end up as a heap of feathers on the bottom of a cage. She must have sensed his deep concern, for she said quietly, Paul, always remember that there are other worlds to sing in. Somehow he felt better, and it was the beginning of a beautiful friendship where he would often talk to the operator and tell her what was going on in his little life. But then one day when Paul was nine years old, his family moved to the city with a more modern telephone where you couldn't just talk to the operator by picking up the phone. But as Paul grew into his teens, the memories of those childhood conversations with the kind telephone operator never really left him. A few years later, on his way west to college, Paul's plane put down in Seattle. He had about half an hour or so between planes. He spent 15 minutes on the phone with his sister who lived there now. And then without thinking what he was doing, Paul dialed his hometown operator and said, information please. Miraculously, he heard the small, clear voice he knew so well, information. He hadn't planned, but he heard himself saying, I've missed your voice. There was a long pause, and then came the soft-spoken answer, Paul? <laughs> Paul laughed. So it's really still you, he said. I, I wonder if you have any idea how much you meant to me during that time. I wonder, she said, if you know how much your calls meant to me. I never had any children, and I used to look forward to your calls. Paul told her how often he'd thought of her over the years, and asked if he could call her again when he came back to visit his sister. Please do, she said, just ask for Sally. Well, three months later, Paul's back in Seattle and he dials his hometown operator, but a different voice answers information. He asked for Sally. Are you a friend, she asked. Yes, a very old friend, Paul answered. I'm sorry to have to tell you this, she said. Sally has been working part-time the last few years because she was sick. She died five weeks ago. Before he could hang up, she said, Wait a minute, is this Paul? Yes, Paul replied. Well, Sally left a message for you. She wrote it down in case you called. Let me read it to you. The note said, tell him I still say there are other worlds to sing in. He'll know what I mean. A lovely little story. Always remember there are other worlds to sing in. Death is not the end. This life is not all there is. Do we really believe that. For most people in the West, they would say they don't know if there's life after death, but they hope that somehow there might be. But there's no certainty there, only wishful thinking. Is the Christian hope in life after death just wishful thinking. Well, according to the Bible, Christian hope is not wishful thinking. As the scripture says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Our confident hope is not just in this life. It is in this life and in the life eternal to come. In fact, the Apostle Paul makes the point of saying, if we only had hope in Christ for this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. So why is Paul so confident in God's promise of life after death? On what is this confidence based? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 7, we read the following words of the Apostle Paul. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And then in verse 11, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. According to the Bible, the solidity of our hope stands or falls on the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
as Paul himself goes on to say in verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. Therefore, the key question this talk is going to address is this. Is belief in the resurrection of Jesus Christ a rational belief? And we shall address this question by asking two questions. Firstly, what is the historical evidence for the resurrection? And secondly, are there any plausible alternative explanations for the historical evidence other than the Christian one? Interestingly, belief in the resurrection of Jesus is something some atheist writers like to point to as an example of the sort of irrational things that Christians believe in. So how can we respond to the claim that belief in the resurrection is irrational? Is there actually any evidence that Jesus rose from the dead? As a Christian author and also a former lawyer, this is a question I'm sometimes asked, and the answer I'm happy to say is, Yes, there is. There is a very compelling case for the resurrection of Jesus Christ based on the historical evidence. Because the strong majority of historical scholars, whether Christian, atheist, agnostic or otherwise, acknowledge the following minimal or bedrock facts about Jesus Christ. Firstly, Jesus died by crucifixion during the Passover in Jerusalem in AD 30 or 33. Secondly, his disciples genuinely believed the risen Jesus appeared to them on a number of occasions over the next few days and weeks. And thirdly, the early church exploded in numbers soon after Jesus' death. These strongly agreed bedrock facts represent a huge shift in terms of what scholars were willing to recognize previously because a century ago, you might get scholars arguing that Jesus never even existed and even up to the 1970s, you would get scholars arguing that the resurrection of Jesus Christ was an add-on idea invented by the church one or 200 years after Jesus' death. However, almost all scholars, whether Christian, atheist, agnostic or whatever, today recognize these minimal facts, including the fact that the disciples believed in Jesus' resurrection right from the very beginning. So why the change? Well, scholars now date the earliest historical source for Jesus' resurrection and appearances to individuals and groups as 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, the passage I read out earlier. Why is that? Well, because they say that these verses are actually not the words of Paul himself, but the words of a Christian creed which Paul is quoting, a creed dating to within five years of Jesus' death. In other words, when we read 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 8, we're reaching right back into history, to the bedrock confession of the very first followers of Jesus. New Testament scholar James Dunn, for example, writes, this tradition, we can be entirely confident, was formulated as tradition within months of Jesus' death. In other words, scholars today unanimously agree that right from the very beginning, Jesus' disciples believed Jesus had risen from the dead, even if they cannot explain why they believed that. For example, the historian Paula Fredrickson states, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. That's what they say, and then all the historic evidence we have afterwards attest to their conviction that that's what they saw. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, but I do know that as a historian that they must have seen something. Similarly, New Testament scholar E.P. Sanders writes that Jesus' followers and later Paul had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, a fact what the reality was that gave rise to the experiences, I do not know. Investigating the case for the resurrection then involves an assessment of which of the available hypotheses or available explanations makes most sense of these remarkable facts, these minimal facts agreed to by the strong majority of academic scholars and historians. And interestingly, this is essentially what judges do with the evidence presented to them in a court of law. They decide what validly constitutes the evidence, and often that evidence is based on the testimony of expert witnesses in their academic field, and then they make inferences from the evidence to the best explanation for the evidence based on the alternative explanations. 
their account of the discovery of the empty tomb by women. Because unfortunately, in that historical setting, the testimony of women was not considered reliable in Jewish or Roman law. In the Talmud, for example, we read, sooner let the words of the law be burnt than delivered to women. Likewise, the ancient Jewish historian Josephus wrote, but let not the testimony of women be admitted on account of the levity and boldness of their sex. And as the historian Geza Vermez has pointed out, because the evidence given by female witnesses had no good standing in a male dominated society, then if the empty tomb story had been invented by the early church to convince people of the reality of the resurrection of Jesus, quote, one would have expected a uniform and foolproof account attributed to patently reliable witnesses, as opposed to one relying on the testimony of women. Secondly, the fact is that the disciples refused to back down on their claim that Jesus had risen from the dead even after they faced terrible persecution. And nothing, says historians, proves sincerity more than martyrdom. Paul's testimony about how he formally violently persecuted the Christian movement indicates the persecution faced by the early church was a really serious business. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul writes, you've heard no doubt of my earlier life in Judaism. I was violently, persecuting the church of God and was trying to destroy it. We also possess strong historical evidence that certain key eyewitnesses were martyred for their faith. Peter, for instance, was executed and most likely by crucifixion. James was stoned. Paul was beheaded. In other words, the disciples had nothing to gain by propagating such a lie, if it was a lie, but everything to lose, including their social standing and physical safety. Whatever they saw, agree historians, Jesus' followers considered it was worth giving their lives for. They were thoroughly sincere. Well, then what about the second option? If the disciples weren't lying, could they have been deceived? Well, you have to ask, who would want to deceive them? Not the Romans. They wouldn't have wanted to create a legend that would challenge Rome's authority in an already politically unstable area. And not the religious leaders. They wanted Jesus dead because he was challenging their religious authority. Well, perhaps Jesus himself deceived everybody and didn't really die. This was for a time a leading alternative theory that Jesus merely swooned or fainted on the cross, revived himself in the tomb, rolled the massive stone away sealing his tomb, somehow slipped past the Roman soldiers guarding the tomb, and then convinced his followers that he had risen from the dead when in fact he had only fainted. The practical impossibility of this theory reminds me of the humorous story of the boy who submitted the following letter to a question and answer forum of a magazine. He wrote, Dear Sirs, regarding Easter, my teacher says that Jesus just swooned on the cross and that the disciples nursed him back to health. What do you think? Sincerely, Tommy. And the reply from the editor apparently was, Dear Tommy, I suggest that you take your teacher and beat him hard. 39 times with a cat of nine tails whip and then nail him to a cross and hang him in the sun for six hours, then run a spear through his side into his lungs and put him into an airless tomb for 36 hours and see what happens. <laughs> Sincerely, Charles. In other words, the swoon theory has been discredited in modern times as going against the weight of historical evidence, including what we know about the thoroughness with which Roman soldiers made sure their crucified criminals really were dead, utilizing techniques such as breaking legs to ensure the crucified can no longer push themselves up to breathe, thrusting a spear into the abdomen, and checking for breathing just to be sure. And secondly, as going against the weight of modern medical knowledge of how crucifixion works, such as the way in which the presence of blood and water from Jesus' side indicates the spear would have pierced into Jesus' heart and lungs. The water, indicative of a buildup of pericardial and pleural fluid in the membranes around the heart and lungs, itself a symptom of severe blood loss and thirst. Also, even if Jesus had somehow merely swooned, despite all that's just been said, he would have been in a state of horrendous disfiguration and trauma. In other words, hardly a picture of a miraculous resurrection. According to Dr. William D. Edwards, in an article written about Jesus' death in the Journal of the American Medical Association, interpretations based on the assumption that Jesus did not die on the cross 
appear to be at odds with modern medical knowledge. Okay then, what about the third option? If the disciples were neither deceived nor deceivers, then perhaps they were just deluded. And some have tried to argue this, that the disciples merely hallucinated Jesus's resurrection. Now, obviously a hallucination theory could explain how it's possible that certain people would individually believe that they had seen someone come back from the dead. However, the problem with this theory is that even though it could account for appearances to individuals, it can't account for Jesus's appearances to groups. As New Testament scholars Gerd Thiessen and Annette Mertz point out, the appearances of Jesus to the disciples as a group are solidly attested in multiple sources. However, we know that hallucinations are not typically a group phenomenon. They are private experiences whose contents can't be shared between multiple individuals. And this is certainly the case if the contents of the hallucination are both detailed and multi-sensory, i.e. where they involve the hallucination speaking and eating with groups of people, for example, as the resurrected Jesus is recorded to have done, and afterwards everyone in the group remembers the same details of what the hallucination said and did and ate. The historian Dale Allison, who surveyed the available scientific studies and literature on hallucinations, concludes, first, hallucinations are rarely seen by multiple individuals and groups over an extended period of time. Second, hallucinations are rarely seen by large groups of people, especially groups of more than eight. Third, hallucinations have never led to the claim that a dead person has been resurrected. And fourth, hallucinations do not involve the person's enemy. And yet in the case of the resurrection appearances of Jesus, Every last one of these rare or seemingly impossible circumstances has come to pass. So thus we see that in light of the alternative explanations for these minimal or bedrock facts, that there is, in summary, only one explanation which makes sense of the evidence. And that is that Jesus Christ really did rise from the dead as he said he would. Even a skeptical scholar like Geza Vermes admits that no plausible alternative explanations have been offered in 2,000 years of historical inquiry that can satisfactorily account for the agreed facts of history. That is, the disciples' sincere claims to have experienced the risen Jesus, the complete transformation of their lives and monotheistic worldviews, and the explosion of the early church. Moreover, and as has been well said, the evidence truly demands a verdict. Something remarkable had to have happened to explain these remarkable facts that, on the one hand, Jesus was arrested, hung naked on a Roman cross to die as a criminal in full public spectacle in what was and still is today a shame and honour culture. Such a humiliating death should have been the end of any movement he was trying to bring about. And yet, on the other hand, the opposite happened. The early church exploded in numbers soon after Jesus's death, peacefully conquered the Roman Empire over time and changed world history. Something extraordinary had to have happened to explain that. As the German historian Martin Debilius puts it, you have to posit an X big enough to explain the Y of the early church. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the extraordinary event that explains it. And as we've seen, there is no plausible alternative explanation available. None. Which is part of the reason why Oxford professor of philosophy Richard Swinburne argues that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is overwhelmingly probable when one considers, among other things, the historical evidence. His book in which he lays out his arguments is called The Resurrection of God Incarnate, and it's published by Oxford University Press, which means that it's peer reviewed at the highest levels of academia. And what that means at the very least is that when it comes to the question of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there is a substantial body of historical evidence in support of it that is taken seriously by scholars at the highest levels and so cannot simply just be ignored. Likewise, British scholar N.T. Wright states, I've examined all the alternative explanations, ancient and modern, for the rise of the early church, and I have to say that far and away the best historical explanation is that Jesus of Nazareth really did rise from the dead. Of course, someone might try to argue 
that they don't even need to consider the historical evidence because they just know that they know that they know that miracles are impossible and people don't rise from the dead. But consider the following illustration given by a judge in the Privy Council in 2008 to explain the power of evidence to change our preconceived notions about what is and is not probable. In this memorable illustration, the judge explains that if a man walking in Regent's Park in London claims to have seen a lion in the park, hardly anyone would believe him because in all probability, he was simply mistaken. It was probably just a big dog. However, if further evidence is brought to light that the lion's cage at London Zoo, which is next to Regent's Park, is open, and that there is no lion in the cage as there should be, then incredible as it seems, it is probably now the case that the man did indeed see a lion. In other words, the circumstantial evidence has rendered what would normally be hugely improbable now very probable indeed. And the moral of the story is, if you're really interested in getting to the truth, you can't just ignore the evidence. Good lawyers should be willing to go wherever the evidence leads, and it's the same with the case for the resurrection. As the scholar Wolfhart Pannenberg points out, if somebody considers it to be a general rule, suffering no exception that the dead remain dead, then of course one cannot accept the Christian assertion that Jesus was raised, but then this is not an historical judgment, but an ideological belief. In other words, Good historians like good lawyers should also be willing to go wherever the evidence leads. And as we've seen, when we consider the minimal or bedrock facts agreed to by the strong majority of New Testament scholars and historians, whether Christian, atheist, agnostic, or whatever, and when we consider the various alternative explanations available to explain these remarkable facts, it's clear that the historical evidence lies overwhelmingly in support of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hey guys, hey dude, it's me, Tom Cousins. Here's the Ocker Studio. I'm actually part of an organisation called Ocker, the Ocker Centre for Christian Apologetics. We make films about the big questions of life and how the Christian message has valuable, we think, answers to those questions. If you enjoyed this film, please check out the other stuff on our channel and also consider liking and subscribing. It helps us make more stuff like this. Also, we want to hear your thoughts. If you've got any ideas for future content, please drop us a message in the comments or send us a direct email. Thanks go out to all the people that made this possible, including the lovely people behind me. Here's a fun fact for you. It takes about 60 hours to make each one of these films and it's all made by our in-house Ocker staff who are funded by donations. So if you do have the means and you feel like it, please do donate. On our website, we've got a helpful button labeled donate. Uh, very easy to press. All right. God bless you guys. Bye.